Code Talker by Joseph Bruchette, Chapter 17, First Landing. All through the bombardment, the President Adams and the other 11 transport ships kept moving in closer to shore. When we were off of Peruda, our own guns opened up, firing ranging shots from our three-inch battery. That way, if anything came back at us from a shore battery, we would have the right range. Nothing came back at us from the island, but our ship's gunners still sprayed it with bursts of 20 mil millimeter fire as we passed the beam. The Marine, who'd been singing, started up again as soon as we fired our last burst. We were slowly making our way toward our eight landing craft, ready for the signal to board. Apparently, our signal was in a different LCVP, and so his voice was getting farther away. He changed his tune now to one that had just become popular this year. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. Land the landing force. It was the command everyone had been waiting for. The big chain rattled as our ship dropped anchor. It was 0645. The landing boat I was in jolted back and forth as it was rail loaded over the side. That is the way we did it then, grandchildren. We'd climb into our landing boats before they were lowered into the water. It made things faster at a time when a few seconds could mean the difference between life and death. Ours was a small landing ship designed for troops, not one of the huge LSTs that carried in trucks and tanks. There were just 30 of us on board. I sat there. Five minutes passed, then ten, waiting. 20 minutes, then half an hour, waiting and not knowing. Those two things, grandchildren, were always very hard for me. Finally, at 0715, the command was given. We were dropped into the waves and our engines roared. I took a deep breath. We were finally on our way toward the island. But we were not there yet. Our alligator would not be the first to touch the beach. Even though we were in the initial landing wave of 7,000 marines. Our beach was the farthest away. We were almost three miles from the shore and our landing craft only went eight knots an hour. It would take us another 10 or 15 minutes. The longest 10 or 15 minutes I've ever known. The shelling kept on as we approached the shore, visible in the growing light as a white line of tide. Rounds from our destroyers passed over our heads to strike the beach. Some shots fell short and landed in the sea, raising great columns of water. The sound of our boat's engines changed. We were no longer going forward, but holding steady. Got a hold here at 500 yards, a blocky Marine with Lieutenant Stripes shouted back over his shoulder. Otherwise, we might get clobbered by our own shells. Then, as suddenly as it began, the shelling stopped. The thunder of the big guns no longer rolled over the water. Our final geyser of spray rose ahead of us, and that was it. It was like being in a movie theater when the film breaks part way through the show, but we still held off the island. That was the main course, said, said the lieutenant. Here comes dessert, fresh fruit delivered by air. The droning sound that had begun coming from overhead turned into a roar as 30 Grumman TBF Avengers came swooping in. The tubby little fighter planes dove like hornets, bombing and strafing the beaches where we'd soon set foot. Their run only took five minutes. Ammunition spent, bombs dropped, they peeled off, heading back toward their base in Linda. Some of the Marines on our landing craft cheered. Nothing could have lived through that. Home run. Bye-bye, Tokyo Joe. I didn't say anything. I just checked my gear, making sure the radio was strapped tightly in front of me. George Kirk, another code talker, who had seen combat on the canal, had given me that advice about our bulky, hand-cranked TBX radios. Always carry this big baby right in front of you, he'd said. It'll protect you from anything short of a mortar round. When it comes to hitting the beach... I'd a lot rather have this than one of those new little portable units. Heck, they won't even stop a 22. 
All right, the lieutenant said. Let's go. Once again, we moved forward in the waves. It was bright enough now to see clearly everything on, in the boat. As I looked back, I noticed something I hadn't been able to see before the dark lifted. Our little alligator had a ramp on the back to be lowered when we got close to shore and swung around so the aft side was toward the beach. That way the landing craft could make a quick run back out to sea once everyone was off. Someone with a sense of humor had written words in big letters on that ramp. Fire exit, women and children first. We were so close I could see how hard the surf was pounding the shore. The beach was not at all like the one we had practiced on at Guadalcanal. It rose up here from the edge of the water as abruptly as a high wall. Fifty yards from that steep beach, the guns opened fire. Not ours this time. They were the guns of the Japanese. A round from a Japanese 77 hit the waves so close to us that our boat rocked like a toy swatted by a giant. But we kept going, bullets pinging off the prow. Keep your heads down, the lieutenant yelled. Get ready to go. There were eight boats in our wave. As we swung around, I saw the boat to our starboard side take a direct hit. It rose up out of the water in an explosion of smoke and flame and spray. When it fell back, it looked as if it had been crushed in a huge fist. Then our ramp grated the sand. Go, go, go! It was not just the lieutenant shouting. We were all yelling that word, and we went. Someone's hand was on my shoulder as we all surged forward, leaping or stumbling onto the beach, firing our weapons in the directions that it seemed the bullets were coming first, falling onto our bellies to get under the deadly crossfire, crawling up that wall of sand to find ourselves confronted by the jungle's thick walls of green. Despite all that confusion, the noise of hostile fire, the sound of men carrying out, crying out as they were hit by shrapnel and bullets. We kept pushing forward. Our train, our training took over, even though some of us were so confused and afraid that we could hardly think. The five boats that survived pulled back from the shore to the President Adams for another load. I don't remember digging a foxhole, but I found myself inside one. My shovel stuck into the moist dark sand and tree roots at the bottom of our four-foot deep hole. The sounds of firing were still all around me as the Japanese continued to cover the beach with their well-planned ambush. Another Marine, close to twice my size, was next to me. I was tying a handkerchief around his arm, which had been wounded by shrapnel. It was Georgia Boy. I hadn't known he was in the landing craft with me, but it must have been his hand on my shoulder, urging me forward as we hit the beach. Chief, he said. Y'all are one tough little Navajo. You know, y'all drug me in here with one hand. I finished knotting the bandage, and Georgia Boy leaned back against the wall of our foxhole. As I looked at my watch, I noticed that my fingernails were broken and bleeding. It was 0845. Of the 12 landing zones, our beach, Blue Beach 1, was the worst. Despite the sound and fury, of our shelling and our air attacks, the Japanese pillboxes had been untouched. Dug deep into the coral, ten yards back from the beach, roofed with coconut palm logs and concealed under a thatch of leaves, 300 Japanese had waited out the storm. Our hundreds of rounds of five-inch shells had either landed too short or too far inland or exploded overhead when they hit the palm trees. I looked back down at Blue Beach 1. It was a mess. The surf and the high sand wall had made it impossible to unload the tanks. They were bogged down and stuck. Dozens of landing craft were bro broached and stranded. Some of us, some so badly damaged by the surf and the coral reef that they'd have to be towed back for repair. However, the main concentration of Japanese defenders had been where we made our landing. Everywhere else, there had been only light resistance. By nightfall, despite our problems, we had once again managed to bring almost 14,000 Marines and 6,000 tons of equipment on shore. Our command post was set up at Cape Torquina. Our Navajo net began sending messages 
from the commanders concerning operational order. Everything from the rear echelon to the forward echelon and back was sent through us, so I had a clearer picture than most. Seventy Marines killed and missing, another 124 wounded. The Japanese had resisted hard, but our superior numbers had finally forced them to disappear back into the jungle. By the late afternoon, everything was as quiet as a picture postcard. It had been a long, strange day. Some of the Solomon Islanders, who had been watching our invasion from the jungle, came out and began wandering around the beach. They were happy to see us. They shook hands with us Marines and patted us on our shoulders. The natives were all barefoot and almost naked. Some of them carried bows and quivers of arrows. Y'all kill any Japanese with that rig? Georgia boy said to one of the islanders whose arrows were tipped with jagged pieces of metal that had once been shrapnel. The man smiled, showing his red stained teeth, as he nodded and held up two fingers. Suddenly, a mortar shell came whistling in ran it 200 feet away, and exploded. Georgia boy dove down into our foxhole. The native man, who survived months of enemy occupation, didn't even flinch. He waved his hand. Him fell a bomb fall too far to hurt we. I hear him coming long time. Want fruit? When he handed us, then he handed us a bunch of bananas. As I drifted off to a fitful, exhausted sleep late that night, I thought about what was the strangest thing of all, that first day of combat. All that fighting had happened without seeing even one Japanese soldier.